By the time the United States entered World War II, the U.S. Army Air Corps, as they were now designated, had been developing new, superior aircraft, all suited for different purposes. Bombers, such as the B-17 Flying Fortress, the B-26 Marauder, and the B-29 Super Fortress. Fighters, such as the P-38 Lightning, the P-47 Thunderbolt, and the P-51 Mustang, which came to be known as the trademark of the Tuskegee Airmen, or Red Tails. Transports, like the C-46 Commando and the C-47 Skytrain. Trainer aircraft, such as the T-6 Texan and the PT-19 planes, were used to educate and train airmen, and even wound up seeing some combat. There were, as there always had been in the combat's so far short history, observation and reconnaissance planes, such as the L-2 Grasshopper and the L-5 Sentinel, evolved as photographic technology allowed the planes to be outfitted with newer and better and faster cameras. Reports from Europe in 1939 and 1940 proved the dominant role of the airplane in modern war. On June 20th, 1941, Major General Henry H. Arnold, then Chief of the Air Corps, assumed the title of Chief of Army Air Forces and was given command of the Air Force Combat Command. When the United States officially entered the war, as Arnold's staff saw it, the first priority in the war was to launch a strategic bombing offensive in support of the RAF against Germany. The 8th Air Force, sent to England in 1942, took on that job. After a slow and often costly effort to bring the necessary strength to bear, joined in 1944 by the 15th Air Force stationed in Italy, the 8th finally began to get results. By the end of the war, the German economy had been pounded to rubble. In the war against Japan, General Douglas MacArthur made his advance along New Guinea by leapfrogging his air forces forward, using amphibious forces to open up new bases. The AAF also assisted Admiral Chester Nimitz's carriers in their island hopping across the Central Pacific and supported Allied forces in Burma and China. Arnold directly controlled the 20th Air Force, equipped with the new long-range B-29 Super Fortresses used for bombing Japan's home islands, first from China and then from the Marianas. Devastated by fire raids, Japan was so weakened by August of 1945 that Arnold believed neither the atomic bomb nor the planned invasion would be necessary to win the war. In addition to James Doolittle's service during the First World War as a flight instructor, he continued to experiment with sustained flight and early navigation instruments. In September 1922, Lieutenant Doolittle accomplished a one-stop flight from Pablo Beach, Florida to San Diego, California in 22 hours and 30 minutes elapsed time, an extraordinary achievement with the equipment available at that time. He helped to develop and test the artificial horizon and directional gyroscope flight instruments and was responsible for the training of pilots to trust their instruments rather than their senses, which could be inaccurate and distorted during intense flight patterns like those experienced in battle. In 1929, Doolittle was the first pilot to take off, fly, and land an airplane using instruments alone, without a view outside the cockpit. On December 7, 1941, millions of Americans now knew with absolute certainty that the United States would enter World War II. Over 300 Japanese fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes attacked the U.S. Navy base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, causing the annihilation or damage of American battleships, submarines, and aircraft, and costing over 2,000 American lives. The next day, war was declared on Japan. The Japanese people had been told they were invulnerable 
An attack on the Japanese homeland would cause confusion in the minds of the Japanese people and sow doubt about the reliability of their leaders. There was a second and equally important psychological reason for this attack. Americans badly needed a morale boost. Four months later, on April 18, 1942, Doolittle planned and led an attack on the Japanese mainland, the very first of the war. Sixteen B-25 bombers were launched from the USS Hornet at 8.20 in the morning, 10 hours and 170 miles earlier than planned, due to a Japanese picket boat that had spotted the Hornet and radioed a warning back to Japan. The bombers were all launched successfully, and they hit their targets, 10 military and industrial targets in Tokyo, two in Yokohama, and one each in Yokosuka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka. None of the bombers were shot down. However, the early takeoff caused each of the bombers problems, and the crews were all forced to bail out of the craft before reaching their landing site in China. 62 out of the 80 airmen made it back to safety. The others were captured or killed by the Japanese. While the attacks did negligible damage to Japan itself, Doolittle's and Roosevelt's main goal, the bolstering of the American morale, was accomplished, and the Japanese forces suffered confusion and loss when units were relocated to protect their homeland. When the company had reconvened, Doolittle was certain that the raid was a complete failure and that the men and aircraft lost in the operation would result in certain court-martial. Far from it. Doolittle was awarded the Medal of Honor. For conspicuous leadership above the call of duty, involving personal valor and intrepidity and an extreme hazard to life, with the apparent certainty of being forced to land in enemy territory or to perish at sea, General Doolittle personally led a squadron of army bombers manned by volunteer crews in a highly destructive raid on the Japanese mainland. The Doolittle raid proved that American airmen could penetrate Japanese airspace and deliver as strong a blow to their mainland as they had to Pearl Harbor and thousands of times over. From February to August of 1945, B-29s routinely firebombed Japan's military industrial complex, destroying aircraft and munitions factories. The raids even included a missed attempt at pumpkin bombing the Imperial Palace. The attacks devastated several Japanese cities, destroying nearly 300,000 buildings in Tokyo and costing an estimation of well over 100,000 lives. In addition to the technological advances made during World War II, some would argue that the beginnings of social advances in America began with the 332nd Fighter Group and the 477th Bombardment Group of the United States Army Air Corps, historically known as the Tuskegee Airmen. The first African Americans to serve as aviators for the United States, the Tuskegee Airmen, so named for the Air Corps training program established at Tuskegee University, an all-black college in Tuskegee, Alabama. Though the units faced harassment from fellow soldiers and even officers, their training, courage, and performance on the field of battle could not be discredited. Their records during the war are exemplary. 150 of the Tuskegee Airmen gave their life serving the United States, but with over 300 missions for the 15th Air Force, over 150 successful bomber escort missions, 112 enemy aircraft destroyed in the air, another 150 on the ground, and 148 damaged, 950 rail cars, trucks, and other motor vehicles destroyed, as well as 40 boats, barges, and one destroyer put out of action, the airmen, or red-tailed angels, as the bomber crews dubbed them, secured their place in an essential part of aviation and Air Force history. Shortly before entering into World War II, 
The United States decided that defense of China was beneficial to our country, so aid was dispatched in the form of volunteer Navy, Marine, and Air Force pilots who came to become a unit known as the Flying Tigers. The pilots trained in Burma and at a base in Calcutta, and they, as well as the 10th, 14th, and 20th Air Force squadrons were responsible for delivering aid to China over the hump, which became a nickname for the Himalayan mountain range. The United States and Great Britain successfully levied an embargo on Japan, cutting off 90% of their oil supply, while the Flying Tigers in the air and Merrill's Marauders on the ground, responsible for building the Lido Road in 1945, the sole ground route into China that wasn't blockaded by the Japanese, helped the Chinese effectively fight back against the invading Japanese. America means freedom, and there's no expression of freedom quite so sincere as music. The attack on Pearl Harbor stirred in many Americans a sense of duty and of a slighted honor that must be restored and of a longing for peace and an end to the killing in the Second World War. The year following the attack, Glenn Miller, already a popular and successful band leader, enlisted in the United States Army and soon transferred into the Army Air Force becoming the band leader for the Army Air Force Band. With a goal to entertain the troops, Miller and his Air Force Band hosted a weekly program broadcast by radio to the front lines. They entertained at bases throughout the United States and Europe and recorded records for the Office of War Information. Miller disappeared in December of 1944, flying over the English Channel. His status is still missing in action. Jimmy Stewart had been drafted by the Army in 1940, but was declared unfit for duty for being underweight. Later, after working out with MGM strongman Dan Loomis, Stewart successfully enlisted in the Air Corps, eventually flying over Germany and Nazi-occupied Europe. The film, Winning Your Wings, produced by the unit, Featuring Stewart, helped the Air Corps reach their recruiting goal of 100,000 pilots. Stewart went on to serve in the Air Force for over 25 years, winning the Distinguished Service Medal and the Flying Cross, and even flying as a non-duty observer in a B-52 on an arc light bombing mission during the Vietnam War. Another movie star working for the war effort was the future President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Reagan was assigned to and served with the 1st Motion Picture Unit from 1944 through 1945, his unit producing over 400 training films. The service of these household names in the Army Air Corps and other branches of the United States military helped to bolster volunteer enlistment and kept those folks back home working towards the war effort. On August 6, 1945, Special Mission 13, consisting of a total of six aircraft, flew over Japan with the central goal of dropping the first ever atomic bomb used in battle. Little Boy, as the first bomb was dubbed, was deployed by the Enola Gay, a B-29 superfortress, and detonated at 1,960 feet above the city of Hiroshima, an industrial and military center of Japan adjacent to many Japanese army camps and supply and logistics facilities. Three days later, on the morning of August 9th, another superfortress, the Boxcar, flew for its intended target, Kokura, which was the site of one of Japan's largest munitions factories. Unfavorable weather conditions rerouted the Boxcar to a secondary target, Nagasaki, one of the largest seaports in southern Japan and home to a host of industrial activity, including the production of ordnance, ships, military equipment, and other war materials. It is estimated that half of the casualties caused in Hiroshima and Nagasaki occurred the instant that the bomb detonated, with the same number of casualties 
from radiation and after effects of the nuclear strike in the following days, months, and even decades. To this day, the bombing's ethical justifications are debated, but there is no doubt that the actions of the Air Force brought swift surrender from Japan's armies.